We now have a solid foundation for chemical thermodynamics in the form of the first and second laws of thermodynamics and especially Gibbs free energy. In this series of videos, I want to transition to talking about physical equilibrium and intermolecular forces. And we're going to start with looking at the idea of equilibrium in general and the concept of equilibrium. If you understand the concept of equilibrium on a deep level, you really appreciate how we think about thermodynamic systems, and in particular, why and how we can ignore the microscopic level and focus only on macroscopic state functions. What we'll notice is within an isolated system, macroscopic change continues to occur until a certain point at which macroscopic change appears to cease. A good example of this is actually found in the system of two ideal gases separated by a partition that we've seen already. If we start the gases off in separate containers and then remove the partition so that the gases can freely intermix, we'll find that both gases have filled the entire volume of the container. And this will continue to be the case for all, all time beyond the point where they reach a certain level of mixing, right? The system is in a state of equilibrium because the gases are not changing macroscopically with time. They both have volume V, which is equal to the total volume of the container. They both have equal pressures. They both have equal temperatures. We would notice no change in any of these state variables over time, and in particular, we would definitely not notice the blue and red gases spontaneously organizing themselves back into left-hand and right-hand compartments, for example. Once the system has reached a state of intermixing like this in the middle of the slide, it's not going to go back and it's in a state of what's called equilibrium. Note, however, that equilibrium does not mean that no microscopic processes are taking place. If we look back again at this ideal gas example, the gas particles are still bouncing around within the container and there is a small but finite chance that they might spontaneously for a brief moment in time organize themselves into blue on the left and red on the right. It just means that macroscopically, on the average, state functions are not changing with time. Another good example of this is provided by dropping some drops of food coloring, say, into a beaker of water. Spontaneously, over time, the dye molecules in the food coloring spread out until we reach a point where the dye molecules are distributed uniformly about the liquid here. Intuitively, we understand that no matter how long we wait for any time, the solution is going to remain perfectly uniform like this. It's not going to spontaneously reorganize into a more organized state like this. That won't happen. And because this uniform situation holds up for all time as long as we don't intervene in the system, this is what we call an equilibrium state. An appreciation of equilibrium is very important for chemistry. Two systems are said to be in equilibrium if their state functions are everywhere equal. But there are different types of equilibrium depending on which pairs of state functions are equal, and we use different adjectives to basically characterize these different types of equilibrium. So for example, there's mechanical equilibrium, where we can imagine two gaseous systems on either side of a movable piston here in blue. If P1 is greater than P2, such that there's a net downward force of the gas in the top chamber on the gas in the bottom chamber, then the piston will move downward spontaneously to a point where there are two new pressures, P1 prime and P2 prime, and on the average, P1 prime will be equal to P2 prime, provided we're in a state of equilibrium. And this is called mechanical equilibrium because mechanical work at this point within the system ceases. The gas on the bottom and the gas on the top will do no work on each other as time moves forward. If we start out with two bodies at two different temperatures and allow them to come into thermal contact such that heat can flow, then heat will flow from the hotter body to the colder body until a final state where, on the average, the two temperatures will be equal. One thing worth noting about this, and mechanical e equilibrium as well, is that small fluctuations in temperature may still lead to tiny heat flows from the top block to the bottom block and vice versa. In other words, microscopic heat flows may still be occurring. The point is, on the average, the bulk macroscopic state functions of temperature will be equal for the top block and the bottom block. That's the key to thermal equilibrium. Now, what about phases in contact? Well, when two phases in contact have different free energies, G1 and G2, we'll get bulk phase transitions until the free energies of the two phases are equal, and this is known as physical equilibrium. 
This probably seems a little bit more non-intuitive than mechanical and thermal equilibrium, but the fundamental principle is the same. The idea is that we look at a, the value of a state function for two systems that are in contact. In this case, it's, say, a system of gas molecules in contact with a system of liquid molecules for the same substance. If those free energies are unequal, then a phase transition will occur until the free energies are equalized. A transition will occur, for example, to bring G1 down to the level of G2 and maybe G2 up a little bit. When we reach a state of physical equilibrium, do note that tiny fluctuations in G may still occur. And so even at equilibrium, and the place to focus your attention is here in this equilibrium state, we still get some evaporation of liquid particles and condensation of gas particles. The important thing for the purposes of physical equilibrium, and the important equation here really, is that the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation at equilibrium. So on the whole, in the bulk system, we don't notice, for example, more gas forming or more liquid forming since the two rates of vaporization and condensation are equal. What this example of physical equilibrium shows us is that there's a connection between free energy and equilibrium. Since a system that's in equilibrium is unchanging on the macroscopic level, that means that no macroscopic processes have delta G less than zero. There are no spontaneous processes that can occur in a system at equilibrium. Any microscopic pro processes that do occur must have dg equal to zero. That is, they must be perfectly reversible. Remember, this is a case where ds of the system is equal to negative ds of the surroundings, such that the process is perfectly reversible and the total entropy change is zero. We can think of these processes as infinitesimally reversible. Things like particles bouncing around randomly inside an ideal gas. Those processes can be reversed because they correspond to dg equals zero. Since the system can't reach another different macrostate spontaneously, that indicates that we're at a minimum of free energy in any process to get to any other state, for example, going from a mixture of A and B to pure B, requires an uphill climb in free energy, or delta G greater than zero. This idea of the equilibrium state as a minimum in free energy is an important one to keep in mind and one we'll see again and again and again on diagrams that show the relationship between free energy and, for example, a chemical reaction or a chemical elementary step, you'll see discrete species in valleys in free energy. These valleys are equilibrium states and the progress of a reaction requires an uphill climb at least a little bit before a reaction takes off. The products, too, we find in a valley for a chemical process.